parents are still alive. They live in the condos at the nursing home. Bernadette lives on a farm. Um, she is a 50-year-old widow, and um, that kind of plays into the mystery of things. Uh, she has a son named Grady, who is the local high school football coach, and he is married to a girl named Julia. And um, so the, if you're still on Main Street, her route is she goes to the post office and she doesn't have a mail carrier car, um, which those have a name um, called LLV, who I got that from one of our own group members, Ashley Youngblood, because she is a mail carrier, so I have texted her and messaged her um, throughout the process and learning some things. As well, I've talked to my local mail carrier and postal service. I go in, they kind of showed me around. So I, it's not that she's in the post office, but at least I know something about it so I don't sound as silly. So um, anyways, what happens is that she also has the whole downtown area. And then when you get to the end of the main street, there is a radio station funny and then there, like I said on the right is the old mill wheel and it still runs behind the old mill wheel is the courthouse and the police station and all those kind of things and I will put up a picture of what it looks like in my head that I had to draw for my son so he can make the interactive map so I'll do that um, after the video but also when you get to the end of the street where the radio station is there's another short, it's called Short Street, and you go over a little bridge, and there um, it takes you to another street um, that's got like eight or so houses on it on one side, but there's a creek that runs on the other side. So this is a mill town with a lot of creeks, which is how they are in Kentucky. And so um, that, that house only, that street, um, it's called Little Creek Street because it's a little creek. They only have those houses on the one side of the street, and it's a dead end. Now, on her way to work every day, she has her route, and um, she has to come back. She does part of her route with her mail carrier bag, and that's called her loops. So her first loop is the businesses and that one street. Then she has to go back to the post office, which she can make over these little bridges, over these creeks, she can go back to the post office to get her second loop, which is some more neighborhood streets behind the post office, behind the courthouse, but everything is wooded. So everything's woodsy. So the, the, um, there's a local country club, and there is a country club neighborhood where all the rich people live, And but she doesn't have that as her area. But you never know, she might trade off and say, oh, I can only do, can you trade my route? Because she's nosy. Um, but anyways, then there is the school that is very popular. They love the high school football, they love all the sports, the very sports oriented um, town for the students. Um, so that's kind of the setup of the town. And that was just a quick setup. So we're gonna go ahead and start reading chapter one where you're going to be introduced to someone in the nursing home by the name of Vince. And Vince is an older gentleman, and I think that you're really going to like him. And so also, we have what's called the front porch lady. So when I was telling you about the neighborhood with the eight houses, um, just think of like little shotgun houses, and they all have the same porches. And there are all these little blue-haired ladies that yell across, what'd she say? What mail did you get today? Did you win Publishers Clearing House? You know, those kind of things. But they know all the gossip. And also, they want to say, hey, Bernadette, did so-and-so get an invitation to that wedding? Because I heard they got in a fight. And they also give her food. And so it's all kind of the gossipy, gossipy group of women, which I have in all my books. Obviously, with the Laundry Club ladies, I have in the Camper series. I have the auxiliary women in the ghostly series. So these are the front porch ladies. So I'm going to read chapter one. I'm not really good at reading out loud, but we're going to try, and it's a few chapters, so bear with me. Good morning, Vince. Vince Caldwell was sitting outside on one of the many swings across the long covered porch at the Sugar Creek Gap nursing home, looking at the morning paper. My phone rang in, and it was Iris as I walked up. This was the second time she'd called this morning. 
and the second time I'd send her to voicemail. Morning, Bernie. Vince pulled the readers off the bridge of his nose and looked up through his bushy gray eyebrows. He patted the open space next to him and put his crossword puzzle down. I was thinking about you this morning, about to turn cold. Hope you start dressing warmer. I'd hate for you to catch a chill. Thank you. I think about you every morning. I took a seat and at that moment knew exactly why Iris had called, but didn't leave a message. Earlier, I was running late for my route. I wanted to try to finish a little early today since it was game day. I still can't believe it's been 10 years, Bernie. Vince reached over and patted my leg. We sure still miss Richard and his guitar. Me too. I sucked in a deep breath. My heart sank into my stomach when I looked at my watch to see the date. The anniversary of Richard's death. Something I'd never forgotten until today. You and Grady heading over to the cemetery for the big game? Vince asked because it was high school football season and wouldn't you know, Grady had gone to college, gotten his degree in sports management with the minor in English where he was now the Sugar Creek Gap High School English teacher and also the head football coach. I'm sure I will. I tugged up in my mailbag and took out Vince's mail. We probably weren't, but I guess I wasn't going to tell anyone. I usually went to see Richard's grave alone. Do you want this or do you want me to put this in your mailbox? It wasn't long after Grady was born that Richard and I had decided that I'd be a stay-at-home mom and quit my job as a mail carrier. Child care was so expensive and Richard had just gotten his first good sales job that took him out of town a lot. It made more sense for me to quit my job than to try to find somewhere or someone to watch him. After Richard had passed away, I'd gone back to the post office. They'd offered to give me my route back, which was a driving route, but the downtown area walking route was available. It was much harder to walk and carry the mail, but staying outdoors kept my mind clear and helped me escape from thinking too much about Richard. I'll just take it, Vince said, bringing me out of my thoughts. Vince was one of the many elderly citizens who had moved to the retirement condos the nursing home had offered. Even my parents lived there too. They weren't retired by any stretch of the means, but it was a low cost and low maintenance way of living and they loved it there. Well, if I'm going to go to the game on time, I better get hustling. I stood up, the extra chains dangled from the, ceil the ceiling of the porch clanked. I handed him his mail. Wow! Vince did his best impression of the grizzly bear sound like the crowd did when someone scored a touchdown. He got up and yelled, Go Grizzlies! Rah, rah! I laughed and put my fist in the air and noticed an Uber driver had pulled up. Where are you going, Vince? Emergency City Council meeting today. I heard some rumblings about Chuck Schilling selling the majority share of the country club to someone. Apparently, at last night's commissioner's meetings, things got a little heated. He didn't mention who bought the country club. But from what I understand, Dennis Coons is up in arms, and it should be a good one. Well, maybe I'll stop by the courthouse on my route, I said, and waved him off. Dennis Coons and Chuck Schilling owned the 120-acre country club that, that it sat on. So why would Dennis be so upset? I pondered the question as I dropped the mailbag on the floor and filled the small community boxes as quickly as possible before I locked them back up and headed out in record time. In light of the news of the sale of the country club, which was huge news if what Vince had told me was true, maybe everyone would not remember that today was the day. Not that I didn't love how my community rallied around me and Grady, but it was like they rehashed it every year, and I was just wanting to grieve on my own. The sun was bright and had warmed the chill of the autumn day to where I could take off my sweater. I tied it around my waist and walked over the old Mill Creek Bridge. Once over the bridge, I was standing where I had started my morning, next to the post office and across the street from where I'd begin the rest of my morning route, the downtown businesses on the left side of Main Street. Eventually, I'd get to the small neighborhood on the west side of downtown, then make my way back downtown where I'd deliver all the mail to the businesses in the business district of Sugar Creek Gap, which included the courthouse, the doctor's building, the bank, and the various other businesses. 
I like to finish my day with a few neighborhoods that were just east of downtown that circled back to the post office. Briefly, I stopped to listen to the sound of the babbling brook across the rocks on the old mill, push the water down the creek. It was a daily ritual that I loved. Only today, there were a lot more cars than usual on Main Street. When I crossed the street, I noticed the cars were all pulling in the courthouse parking lot. Out of curiosity and what Vince had said about the country club, I was going to switch up my route and deliver the mail to the courthouse just so I could pop my head into the emergency town council meeting. Social Network was the first business I came to. It was our local yarn shop owned by Leota Goldie. She was a whiz with any sort of material. She was the go-to gal for anything that needed to be altered and lettered. She had the monopoly on all things named with names on them, including all the business she got from the Sugar Creek Gap School and Sports Team. When I pushed through the door, the bell over the bell above knocked against the glass door. Leota looked up. Morning, Bernadette. She greeted me with a pair of knitting needles in her hand. You doing all right today? I sure am, I said and headed over to the counter. I reached around and grabbed her mail out of my bag putting it in the basket that sat next to the register. No mail today? Nope. She stood over a customer's shoulder watching as they were knitting something. I generally was there the same time each day, which was when Leota gave a lesson or two. I was not a knitter or any type of crafter, but I enjoyed watching. I'll have some mail tomorrow. I'll be writing out my bills this afternoon. She pointed one of the needles to the coat rack where some of the fluffy fall colored scarves hung. I made some new scarves for tonight, gang. You take one if you like. It's gonna turn real cold this week. These sure are pretty, I thumbed through them. But Grady and Julia gave me the personalized scarf for my birthday this summer that you made. So I guess I better use that or they'll skin my hide, I joked thinking Grady probably had no idea that his wife, Julia, had given it to me. Oh, that's right, she looked up at me and smiled over the shoot student's shoulder. He is such a good boy, Bernadette, and that Julia, she is a quick learner. Julia Butler was his wife. They met in college and she worked at Mac Tabor as Mac Tabor's secretary. He was a good family friend who was also the local architect in Sugar Gap Creek. She graduated in business school They'd gotten married a couple years ago and yet to give me a grandbaby. Quick learner, I asked. Yeah, she's been coming over here and taking a class from me during her lunch break. Well, that was news to me, but not unusual since Julia's office was just a couple doors down. You be careful out there this morning, she pointed her needle toward the window at the streetscape. All sorts of people canceled their knitting appointments because they're up in arms about the sale of the country club. Did you hear about last night's meeting? Well, somebody said something about it over at the nursing home this morning. I watched alongside her as another car zoomed down the street. I wonder why so many people care, Leota shrugged and walked back to her student. I have no idea. I'm not a member of the country club. I put my hand on the handle of the door. Well, I'll see you at the game, Leota called out in front of me from across the shop. Sounds good. My phone buzzed again. I stopped on the sidewalk and pulled the cell out of my pants pocket. When I saw it was Iris for the third time, I figured she really wanted something, so I answered it. Hey, Iris, I answered and continued to deliver the mail to the very area businesses. Mostly the owners were busy with customers or not in front of their shops when I delivered their mail, so I popped in and out as quickly as I could. I pretty much perfected my system over the past 10 years. Where have you been? I've been calling and texting you all morning. I I about left pies in the oven to come find you. Ira sounded a little more on edge than the typical yearly bad feeling for her friend call. Maybe she was calling about the pumpkin sugar cookies I volunteered us to make for the high school boosters tonight. I'm fine. I'll meet you at my house right after I get finished delivering my mail route. I didn't tell her I'd already baked several dozen of the pumpkin sugar cookies last night when I couldn't sleep. I totally forgot it was the day until Vince reminded me. I feel awful. I bet Grady wonders why I hadn't texted him, I told Iris. Huh? Iris, Iris sounded all sorts of confused on the other end of the line. It's Richard's date of death. 
Was she pulling my leg? Iris never forgot. Oh my God. Iris' voice was so loud it made my brain rattle through the phone. Bernadette, I'm so sorry. What kind of best friend am I? How are you? Did you get any sleep? Are you working? Of course you didn't get any sleep. You said you were working, but oh, I'm a bad friend. No, you, you're a great friend. I'm fine and I slept. I lied. I just told you that I totally forgot. I stopped shy of Tranquility Wellness Spa to make sure I didn't disturb any of the classes that were, they were having inside the quiet time. Tranquility Wellness was, one, was a one-stop Zen shop. They offer all things the name would allude you to, from spa treatments, yoga classes, meditation classes, nutrition classes, and any sort of medi spa that I wanted to check out. So, so if you're calling to check on me so early this morning, then what is up, I asked her. Well, first off, I think it's a great sign that you forgot. Maybe you can start dating now. Huh, leave it up to Iris to fix me up. She's been trying to do so for the past nine years, leaving me one year to grieve. Not on your life, I said. The last thing I want is a man to have to cook and clean for. I looked into the window to see if there was a yoga class or something before I crept in and laid the mail on the counter. Anyways, what's up? For a brief moment, I stopped and took a deep breath. Even though I knew Peach's part and the owner used a machine to pump a spa smell from a bottle into the vents, it made me still feel good to inhale and exhale when I was in Tranquility Spa. Oh, I had me a feeling. I know you don't want to hear about it, but I was wondering if you'd been to Matt Tabor's house yet. Iris, Iris knew I asked her to stop telling me about her feelings after Richard's death. No, I haven't got that far in my deliveries, I told her. I'm about to stop at Pie in the Face. Are you there? Pie in the Face was the name of her company. It was created after she caught Bobby Peters cheating on her in their very own bed. Not only were he and all the, and the not only were he and the girl all snuggled up, they'd been eating Iris's homemade pie right out of her pie plate. Forget he was cheating. Iris never let anyone eat out of a pie plate. You don't even cut a piece out of the pie plate, she said, was what she told him. Oh, I'm sorry about that, I messed up. You didn't even cut a piece of the pie out of the pie plate, was what Iris had told me she said to the cheating couple when she found them and the pie on the bedside table. You get a pie in your face, she yelled at them. Then she picked up the pie and slammed it into his face. Of course, she came to the house all tore up. Richard and I couldn't stop laughing, but Richard then had suggested that she make her baking a side, her baking side hustle into a real business. That's when Richard jokingly said that she could call it pie in the face. So whenever Bobby Peters had to drive downtown to get to his lumber yard, the name on the bakery would constantly remind him of his philandering ways. She ran with, with Richard's idea and had a very successful bakery now. I did bake some too, but she paid me for them to bake. But most nights, we were just baking in my farm kitchen, keeping each other company. If not for Iris and our friendship or our fun nightly baking sessions at my house, I wouldn't know what to do with all the free time in the evenings now that Grady was married off. That's when being a widow was the hardest, at night. I'm not at the bakery. I had a few deliveries this morning, and now I'm off to the high school to teach, about, teach some cake baking decorating 101. Iris was also the baking consultant for the high school economics department. Anyways, when you get to Mac's house or business, make sure that he's all right. And I have some outgoing mail, so be sure to grab it because I'm not sure Gerald ain't even heard me say I was leaving. So on her phone, she was on her phone Instagramming some of my pies. So Iris and I hung up after I had agreed to check on Mac. Geraldine Workman was Iris's only employee. But quickly, I text Grady. I knew that he would be busy in his classroom to even get my text, but I still didn't want the day to go by 
and us stand there with sadness looking at each other on the football field that night. There was a group of men standing on the sidewalk in front of the Wallflower Diner. That was my mom and dad's place. One of them was Dennis Coots. I walked slower and pretended I was going through my mailbag to collect what, the, what mail I had for the diner. I recognized the other men from the football games. They all liked to hang over the chain link fence instead of sitting in the stand with their wives. I'm telling you, Matt Tabor threatened me last night when I told him I didn't agree with Chuck selling his part of our country club to him. He is not going to get away with this. When anyone mentioned Matt Tabor's name, it got my attention. Dennis Coon's big belly hung over his pants, and he had a toothpick stuck in the corner of his mouth. His thin brown hair was combed to the side and to, to help cover up the bald spot, but he didn't do a good job at it. He had plump cheeks, and he was plump himself. <clears throat> I heard it with my own ears, one of the other men said, although I didn't look to see who it was. This emergency city council meeting better settle it because I don't have time to listen to this crap at tonight's game. We've got to bring home a win, the man shook his head. The city council and the commissioner better get on the same page before this town implodes. As the mother of the coach of the team that's supposed to win, it was hard for me to pinch my lip. These men love to give their two cents on how they run the plays that Grady instructed the boys on the field. Once, I didn't keep my mouth shut, and Matt Grady was mad at me for a week. He said I should know better, and it was part of me being a mom of a coach. Nonetheless, I was a mom, a Sugar Creek Gap grizzly mom that was a bear in her own right. Matt Tabor and Chuck Schilling will regret it if they show up this morning, Dennis Coons folded his hands over his big belly. If it weren't for them talking about Matt and how Iris was hell-bent on those feelings of her, I probably just would have walked by with tonight's game being the only care in the world. <clears throat> you only own 40% from what Chuck Schilling told me last night after football practice because it seems like it's a pretty done deal. Another one of the men had spoken up. I also recognized him as Peter Day. Peter's son Samuel was the star of the high school football team, and I knew his wife, Elaine, from Boosters. Chuck pretty much said it was a done deal. Said it right there while we were standing on the 50-yard line. Another one of the men in the circle stuffed some money in his wallet and went to put his uh, pocket, went to put it, back, put it back in his back pocket when his elbow hit me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. I stopped nearly stumbling over my own feet. I should have been watching where I was going instead of sorting through the mail. I sucked in a deep breath and slid my gaze over to Dennis. Hey, aren't you Richard's widow? Dennis asked me at the furrow brow. Yes, I said. It was a title that I was given and hated. It was what it was. You've got a great son, good football coach. I'm really looking forward to tonight's big game. He smacked Peter on the back. They all nodded. Well, not Dennis. Your husband and Matt Tabor, they were best friends, right? Dennis's chin lifted a little in the air, and he stared down at me with his nose. Yes, they were, I confirmed, my stomach tightened. I could feel the gut punch coming. Will you tell him that if he thinks he's going to get his hand on my country club, he'll have to go through me to do it, Dennis said through his grunted teeth. The other men laughed. I'll see you gentlemen tonight. I hurried past them and pushed the diner door open. Go Grizzlies, my dad sat at the counter with the other regulars. Go Grizzlies, I pumped a fist in the air and weaved in and out of the pool table. Here's the mail. I handed my mom the stack of various food service bills and magazines she loved to display throughout the diner for those eating alone. What's the deal with the country club, I asked her. Sure enough. There was a line out the door when we got here this morning. Mama shook her head. Her hair was still nice and brown, giving me hope I'd inherit, I wouldn't inherit my father's gray hair he'd gotten in his 50s. Mama was a little plump around the waist and hips. In those years of good cooking and all the people cooking for the people in Sugar Creek Gap, the years had been kind to her. She had very few wrinkles and wore very little makeup. You know, I can't make no hide nor hair of the truth, she said, but I do know something about Mac Tabor. I was going to ask Julia about this morning, but she grabbed a biscuit and coffee before she headed out. Something about a long day. 
Julia and Grady lived over top of the diner in the one-bedroom apartment. It was perfect for them since they both worked near downtown. Julia's office was next door at Tabor Architects, and the high school was just about a mile down the road. Really, I should have been living in the apartment, and they should have the farm. I couldn't think about that right now, though. Uh-oh, you've got that look in your eye. Mama handed me a styrofoam box filled with some biscuits. What are you thinking? Oh, nothing. I shrugged and took the box. For Harriet, I asked about the biscuits. Yeah, she's got the ladies coming over this morning for some front porch gossip, Mom winked. I told her I'd send some biscuits with you. Mom always had me delivering something like I was Uber Eats or something. Gertrude has made some of her blueberry jam and canned a lot for winter. Winter, I think I'll get some for the diner. Gertrude Stone, hands down, made the best jam in Sugar Creek Gap. You in a hurry? Mom asked when I put the container in my mailbag and started to wave. Yeah, I'm thinking about switching up my route and heading over to the city council meeting to see what's going on around here, I sighed. It appears as if everyone has lost their minds over this country club thing. Rightfully so. When change happens in a community, every one of us try to figure out where we all belong in the new system. I think that's what's going on. Mama swiped the towel across the counter before she tucked it back into her apron. She took a to-go box from underneath the counter. For Rowena, tell her granny sent them. Aw, oh, I took the bag of leftovers my mom liked to give my cat. She'll love it. I stuck it in my mail carrier bag. I'll see you tonight. Of course you will, Mom said. Mom and Dad never missed anything of Grady's. Even now, in their mid-70s, they were just as active as the day I brought him home from the hospital. I gave her a quick hug, and my dad and I kissed before we headed out the door. Quickly, I delivered the mail between the shops between the diner and Tabor Architects. Good morning, I'm so glad to see you, I greeted Julia, my daughter-in-law, when I walked to the front of in her front office. You won't believe how crazy people have gotten over Dennis Coontz and his partner Chuck Schilling selling the country club, Julia told me some, new, some other news. And now Mac is buying it. So it was confirmed. This was the news that would travel fast in Sugar Creek Gap. He is? I wondered if Iris had a feeling because she heard the big news. Yes, Mac has been doing some layouts for the new condos he wants to build. He told them about his plans at the city council meeting last night. Worst mistake ever. Julia shook her pretty blonde hair and put her hands up to her head. I've already got a throbbing headache from people calling and protesting. What am I going to do? I don't make the decisions around here. About that time, the phone rang. Julia put her finger up for me to hold on. I glanced out the door when I noticed a few of the city council members and the mayor walking toward the courthouse with some sign under their arms. I almost got a crook in my neck to see what the sign said, but I couldn't get past their glares at me through the window. What did I do? I shook my head and turned back to look at my daughter-in-law. Tabor Architects, she answered the phone. I'm sorry, Mr. Tabor isn't in right now. May I take? Julia pulled the phone away from her ear and looked at it before placing the cradle. This town has lost her mind. She grabbed the ringing phone. She put her hand over the receiver and over the mouth and said, I'll see you at tonight's game. I'll save you a seat in the stand.